Um, she was trying to give you the taper all over the place because she was trying to get cracked is what she was trying to do. But yeah, while I'm in the car, I'm explaining to her, I'm trying to be a witness for Jesus, saying, you know, Jesus forgives those who, who, um, who come to him and ask for it type of stuff. So I was able to witness to a person who may or may not have been able to um, have his, you know, in their life as far as somebody there instead of just like the guy that she was getting cracked from or something, hey, give me that 10. I said, hey, instead of that 10, why don't you try to find yourself, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but anyway, just to praise that I was able to show her that, you know, God is still out there and he put me into her life, even if it was for a moment, even if she doesn't um, turn her life over right then, at least I was there to kind of put something in her mind. Amen. Amen. That's what we're out there for, reaching up and reaching out. Right. But, yeah, because at first it was to a gas, uh, right to a gas station. Then all of a sudden she wanted me to take her to an apartment complex. And she didn't tell me what it was. She's telling me in the car, oh, by the way, I'm a prostitute. I've been doing this for six months. Oh, by the way, I'm a crackhead, uh, and I'm going to get crack right now. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> I was taken back, but I, and she said, you know, please don't judge me. I said, I'm not here. Look, I can judge you, but it's depending on how I judge you that makes all the difference in the world. But, you know, I dropped her off wherever and said, hey, good luck to you. You know, but while I was in the car with her, I was able to talk to her about God and his forgiveness. And he seeks those who see, or he'll receive anybody who would want to receive him. Amen. And that's the best I could do. Amen. All right. Somebody else with a praise? Yeah. I'd like to thank the Lord for being here on Sunday night. I'm always good to be here on Sunday night. And I always have a... And the mornings are great. But you're you're ready for Sunday night. It's even better. All right. Thank you. That is, that is so neat. You know? All right. To leave out of here blessed. And you have good money because you got it in your heart. And you know what you're thinking about. Got a little better recharge, right? Okay. Uh, I, I'd like to give a, a praise to my wife. Um, you guys all know I had surgery, and she put up with my whining of surgery. <laughs> I'm not a very good patient at all. Um, but I also would like to give praise for her. Um, she's going through some hard times, which we all know, and a lot of changes are happening in our household. And um, she's just a trooper, and, and it's, it's, all, it's all for the love of God that gets us through each day. Um, the, the more I say that, the more I believe it, and, and that, that, that really is the truth. I'd also like to give a praise to uh, Prefix for all they do for the food pantry and for the ministry, because without them, we would all be walking around here with really bad backs. Um, so I'd like to just give out a praise to them. I, 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 I follow them on Facebook, and if anybody can follow them and give them more, more off on out there, I think it would be really awesome to do. Um, but and just keep us all in your prayers. Um, like I said earlier, uh, Justin, our adopted stolen son, um, we think got a job, um, and we think we scared him away with all the work we were making him do. And he moved in with his dad, but we, we were having paint. But, you know, with a, he painted the garage with a paint with a paintbrush, and you know all that stuff. So we kind of he was not a, a very non-motivated child. And we think we motivated at least out of our house. So <laughs> it's easier to call on the sheriff department. <laughs> so just keep him in up where any in your prayers that he's doing the you know he's doing the right things now. We we, we showed him the right way at least um, with um, you know how a household is supposed to run. He didn't come from a very good family. Right. So we showed None him. Not I mean. But we can all look back and be like, yeah, my family's dysfunctional. Yeah, but he's, I mean, he was a very, very dysfunctional family. Yeah. I mean, and uh, so we showed him, you know, what, you know, we did his word, you know, what, you know, prayer for him before dinner. And, right. you know, he would even come up to snag something and he'd be like, is Eric here? Do, do we have to pray first? So, I mean, it was kind of cool that we, we showed him some good things. So, hopefully, mm -hmm. next time with him. So, just, I just want to give the Lord praise for just my life. Um, Amen. Had one of the little kiddos last night. I had arrived early, for the, or Friday night for the Christmas decorating. And one of the little kiddos, she came in and, and she says, I'm not going, because it was like quarter of six before anybody was here. And she says, I'm not going back outside. My family's crazy. <laughs> okay. Um, but anybody seen the Transformers movies? 
the company across the street built those robots uh, in the movie, yeah. And they come over every Wednesday faithfully with the high low and unload everything for us. Praise the Lord for that. Now, anybody else with a praise? Because I got one best of all. Um, this morning, when, uh, and sometimes I, you know, I feel like a four-speed transmission. I'm just not getting out of second gear. And that was, uh, that's how I felt. But my wife says I did all right. Um, but it was, my, I felt um, oppressed. Anybody ever uh, spiritually oppressed? Like the enemy was on me. Um, and I, so I give the salvation message. And um, it wasn't really geared towards you all. Um, and so that's kind of unusual sometimes for me um, because I try to, I try to you do my service where everybody is applicable uh, for everybody. And I hope you all is able to take something home for it. But today I was concerned about salvation and the Lord was as well. Um, and so I, the young lady went forward to pray. And so I went over to get my wife's attention to go over and pray with her. And I had, remember I had been giving that call to come to the altar to get saved. And so as I went over here, um, I walked all the way over here and um, I seen the fellow who was who raised his hand for salvation step out of the aisle, but he, then he looked up and seen I was over here instead of over there, and then he turned around and stepped back in his, in his place. So um, I still give the opportunity to pray where you're at. The Lord impressed him on my heart. Well, you got to get him to pray where they're at. I'm like, all right, so... Here goes the test, you know, the, the uh, altar call. And uh, so on the way out, he hugged me and he says, I asked the Lord to save me today. And then that, that was Tom who was sitting right there. He comes and sits with Tracy a lot over here. He was um, uh, rented a room for her, from her for a couple years. So he's been here off and on for the last couple years. Um, but y'all pray for Tom. All right. He accepted the Lord. And so what happens? What happens when you accept the Lord? What was that? The enemy is right there. All right. So let's pray for Tom. All right. The Lord will give him a great week. Brother Fred talks about church gives you start to a great week. Uh, putting on that old, that new coat, taking off that old coat. Um, what a blessing. So that's a praise. Amen. When people start giving their heart to Jesus. And then we have people raise their hand. Christian folks that wanted to be ready and waiting and watching for the Lord. Because um, he may come tonight, folks. He may come for me. He may come for you. So, all right. Anybody else with a comment, question, uh, praise, item? All right. Tonight we're going to uh, finish up our series uh, on choices. Uh, this would be part three of our series on choices. Uh, all of us make choices. And we talk, we've been talking about the flesh and the spirit. Uh, the flesh and the spirit. Um, Somebody help me out with what the choices that we make every day with the Spirit, capital S. What are some choices that we make in the Spirit of the Lord? To pray. To pray. All right, good. Anybody else? To study. To study. Amen. Somebody else? Doug had a good one, whether I should witness or not. Yeah. And he made that spiritual choice to witness. Very good. Somebody else? Well, as I often hear that we might be that only person they get. Mm -hmm. And he may have sent us to that person specifically. Amen? Amen. Um, and so we all have choices that we have to make. Uh, and the choice is a uh, choice to serve the flesh or we serve the spirit. And so tonight we're going to... Um, uh, dive in and I'll just give you a quick brief overview to catch you all up. This is part three. If you want to see the first two, part one and part two, they are on our YouTube channel. You can check those out. Uh, actually, part two is still sitting on my desk in the memory card, so it's not there. It's going to be up tomorrow. All right. Um, so as Christians, we enjoy wonderful freedoms in Christ, and it is truly the desire of Christ that we be free. And, uh, but if we're not careful, desires of the flesh can wreak self-destruction. All right. Anybody who has been watching the TV news this past three or four weeks uh, and all the public figures and what's going on with all them folks? All right. Um, but to prevent this, the Apostle Paul commands us to walk in the Spirit. 
uh, Christian friend. Uh, I don't know. I really have doubts about how many people in Washington, D.C. actually have a true walking, talking relationship with Jesus. Uh, um, but uh, all you have to do is watch them for a year, and you can tell they they, they rather care. They really care about themselves they rather than us. They have a walk talk with money. What's that? I said they got to walk and talk with money. Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, our money, by the way. Uh, but to encourage us to walk in the spirit and not to carry out our own desires of the flesh, we're going to spend several. Well, this will be the third lesson of the several that we started. Uh, perhaps a good place to begin as we started the lesson was uh, why make any effort to walk in the spirit. Why not just to succumb to the flesh? Why make any effort to walk in the Spirit? I've asked that question when we first opened two weeks ago. Why make any effort to walk in the Spirit? Hey, you want to get closer to the Lord. If you're walking just on the street there, you have to be getting farther from Him. You don't want to be with Him. But it's, yes. Eternal damnation. I mean, that, that alone scares me. Mm hmm. Okay. Amen. It's a commandment. Amen? And so there, it benefits us to walk in the, in the Spirit, doesn't it? Now, are there benefits to walking in the flesh? No. No, no, no. For a time. In the long term, no. No. In the short term? Correct. Yeah. All right. And uh, But there's also penalty for walking in the flesh. What's that? For a yeah, pleasure and sin for a season. So the spirit and the flesh are contrary one to another. We spoke about that. Also, a Christian must serve one or the other. You can't serve both. Uh, so we need to be cautious about that. So if you're led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 18. We read that last week. So what does that mean that we're not under the law? We're under grace. So those walking in the Spirit are not under a combination of the law, the law, but we are under grace. And so we uh, are to be obedient to the gospel, and it is revealed to us by the Spirit, and it results in freedom. Freedom from condemnation. Uh, Sister Mona said something about if we walk after the flesh, we have that we, we're walking in jeopardy. All right? So there are a lot of folks out there walking after the flesh and walk after jeopardy. Um, and that is a dangerous place to be. Uh, what happens to the Christian believer who continues to walk after the flesh and not after the spirit? What happens to that Christian believer? They turn away. They're not close anymore. They turn away. There's a relationship issue, isn't there? Yeah. All right. Um, and I have seen that time and time again. And, and especially, man, Judy have been in ministry for all of our, pretty well all of our lives. Um, and... Uh, Kelly and Tom, uh, brother and sister Knight, we've all through all six of us been together in ministry for over almost 40 years. And we have seen time and time again, Christian believers, all right, let me give you this for example. Brother Knight might have a friend who is this close. You know how he tells there's a problem in the, their walk with the Lord? Is when that friend starts putting a distance between him and his friend. Because it causes relationship issues when we're not walking in the spirit, if we walk after the flesh. So it causes relationship issues, not only with our other brothers and sisters in Christ, but it causes, like Brother Fred said, it causes that this relationship issue to really get severed. Now, I'm not talking about forever severed, but I'm talking about where God cannot bless us. All right? Someone with a comment question? All right? So here's part three. And uh, I want you to stay with me for just a little while. Um, part three, we're going to speak about fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. And you will not inherit the kingdom of God. All right. Um, take your Bible, turn to the book of Matthew. And uh, we, we're going to dance around the scriptures here for a little bit. Matthew chapter 25. Verse number 34. Our scripture verse is, Fulfill the lusts of the flesh, and you will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
And that is found in Galatians chapter 5, <clears throat> starting in verse number 16 through verse 26 is where our, that passage of Scripture is. All right? And so here is the reference to the heavenly kingdom spoken to, spoken of by Christ. Matthew chapter 25, verse number 24. Uh, let me back up one page. It says this. Everybody there? I thought you said 24 or 34. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. 34. 25 verse 34, and I was actually on the right page. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom of God, prepare for you, foundation of the world. And so the heavenly kingdom is referenced by Jesus himself, is spoken of by the Lord. And then we look over to 2 Timothy, over to your right, just a few books. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse number 18. All right, everyone there say amen. Amen. All right. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto the heavenly kingdom to whom will be glory forever and ever. Amen. Um, anybody ever looked at an old saint? And I say that with utmost respect. And every time you talk to them, they have the longing in their eye is more and more towards heaven. And they look for that day that the Lord's going to call them home. The Apostle Paul had that longing in his eye to go home. Uh, and in a, three or four weeks ago, I preached a message, and I can't even recall the title of it, but one of the analogies I used in my sermon was this. When we're young, as in teenage years, we, we have milestones that we get. We have a milestone. How many of you remember that milestone? You just couldn't wait to get your driver's license. I mean, that was, man, for me, that was... And then I found out I'm just going to be the family gopher after I got my driver's license. Yeah, so, mine. yeah. Um, they give you a quarter pounder but cheese. I wanted a Big Mac. Now I have to drive all the way back. Um, but we have these milestones that we get, and so the children uh, grow up with milestones. They want to get their driver's license. They want to graduate high school. Maybe they got ideals to go into college or join the military. Go here, go there, and then they have this maybe this this ideal situation where they want to get married or do this or do that, and they always are looking for markers or mile markers or milestones of accomplishments in their life. But as we get older, as we get more mature, as we get a little age under our belt, as we get have past those milestones, our priorities change a little bit. We're no longer pursuing the things of our youth. But now we're looking towards heaven. Um, and I'll ask you a question. How many of you this morning, this evening, if you got the call uh, in the morning that Pastor Buddy died in his sleep. How many of you would say, you know, Pastor Buddy was waiting for that day? All right. I'm waiting for that day. I'm no hurry. Don't get me wrong. I want God to keep me here as long as I can stay here. But if something happens to me that I fall asleep in, in Jesus, don't fret, don't cry, don't weep for me because that is where I wanted to be. And by the way, that rhymes. And so what the Apostle Paul here is saying, simply stating, he's saying, listen, the day is coming that I'm going to be in God's heavenly kingdom that he's prepared for me. And so that heavenly kingdom is looked forward to by Paul. And then if you want to take your Bibles, take a, uh, look over to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. Paul referred to that heavenly kingdom as well, 2 Peter chapter 1. If you're there, say amen. 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 All right. Verse number 10 says this, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered to unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so let me read to you what our writer says here. And I have a writing study Bible here in my little helps. It says, <coughs> Make your calling and election sure. It means confirms one's profession of faith by godly living. And then verse 11 here, it's a Christian's life that can be rewarded, will be provided with that abundant entrance into heaven. All right, somebody help me out 
Where's this place called heaven at? Theological question. It's the end of a Christian life. What's that? It's the end of a Christian life. It's the end of a Christian life? Okay. Where's the abode? Where's that place at that we go? Anybody want to help me out? Where's God dwell at? In our heart. What's that? In our heart. All right. Where's the presence of God? We know He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at one time, but he, there is also a presence of God. Isaiah chapter 6 talks about that. That's the Holy Spirit. What's that? The presence of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Good. I'm, I'm fishing. I get it. Yeah, I don't know where you're going. All right. The book of Isaiah, Isaiah says, In the year King Uzziah died, I was high and lifted up into the throne room of God. And the train of his robe filled the temple. <coughs> and it says that the seraphims were over his throne. And they cried, Holy, 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 Holy is the Lord of hosts. And uh, the whole world is full of his glory. And they do that day and night. That's what the seraphims do. They hover over the presence of Almighty God, Yahweh, the Almighty God, the never-ending of days, the Alpha and the Omega, that's where the presence of God is in the third heaven. So let me help if I can draw you a word picture here. If you go outside, and last night I, we came home uh, from cleaning up the flood, uh, and <laughs> we came home and the moon was out, and there was a massive halo around the moon. It was awesome. Um, but if you look up there, you see the heavens. That's the first heaven. And if you look at beyond that heaven that you see into the galaxies, that's the second heaven. And beyond the galaxies is the third heaven where the presence of God dwells. You have to take that by faith, brother, sister. All right, brother Fred? Uh, tonight in 745, I think it is, that's when the moon is supposed to be at its best. Yeah, the super moon. Oh, the super moon? moon? Yeah. The three planets align. But that's where we find the presence of God. And so when we die, the Bible says that our spirit goes back to God who sent it. All right? And so that's where we will go. And so we find here that Christ referenced that heavenly kingdom. Paul referenced that heavenly kingdom. Peter represent, uh, represented that heavenly kingdom uh, and referenced it. So I want you to notice the emphasis by Paul. There is a double warning of which uh, Galatians uh, chapter 5, verse number 21. I'll just read that. You won't have to turn there. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past. You see, he wants to be sure that we don't miss it. And sad to say, there are going to be millions upon millions that miss it. Who was hell created for? Satan. 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 Satan and all of his henchmen. But the scripture tells us that because of man's evil, that hell hath enlarged her mouth. Because of man's evil heart. So there are going to be millions upon millions that miss it. How, how sad would it be to miss it? I preached a sermon probably 25 years ago, 20 years ago, called about, um, anybody ever been on a miracle round? And they have the, have the thing on the post as you go by and you pull the rings out. All right. Uh, and I don't know, I guess you get so many rings and you trade it in for prizes or something at the carnival. And I preached a sermon about missing the brass ring. There's so many people going to miss it. People who thought themselves to be Christians. Who had a head knowledge of Jesus but never had a heart knowledge. But I tell you what, if we have a heart knowledge of Jesus, you know what we will have a heart's desire for? Amen. To go see him one day. And uh, that is what we look for. And that's what Doug was trying to tell that lady today. There's a, even though you may not have said it verbally, that there's a kingdom that God has prepared for those that love him. He's trying to help her understand about that kingdom. And there's a wonderful kingdom out there to have. But we have to be the ones who, who are the ones who are propagating that kingdom, just like Peter did, just like Paul did, just like Jesus did about the heavenly kingdom that we're to gain. I just have a question, good sir. Yes. Um, when we get to heaven, if we know people that aren't there with us, what happens about that sadness? Or do we forget those people? Or what? 
Yeah, no, no more tears, no more death, no more dying, no more sadness, no more any of those things. So do we forget those? Yes. Those will be wiped. Those who have, that we parted with, that, well, how, how horrible what a place would it be if you <laughs> left loved ones behind that went to hell. Well, that's what I mean. Like, if you we know? go to heaven, say, I'm just saying for the sake of the question, like say you know a parent may not have went to heaven, so you might forget that parent when you're in heaven. God will wipe all all sadness from our from our memories. I thought that was after the millennium reign. When we go to heaven, those things will be taken because there is no more sin. There is not sin in heaven. Sin cannot enter into heaven. No recollection, no memory of sin. No tears, no pain, no okay. nothing. Just happiness. Amen. And isn't that the beginning of our Christian life, not the end? Um, I mean, Reverend Knight said that's the, that that's the end of our Christian life, but isn't that really the beginning? Our, our life here, but then when we get over there, that's when the real adventure begins. Amen. Amen. And so we ought to look, I, I look for heaven, um, and, and can I be honest with you, as a kid I wanted to get these, because I, I would always heard a preacher talking about the, uh, the rapture, the rapture, the rapture, and as a kid I was like, I haven't done this, and I haven't done this, and I don't, you know, I'm like, Jesus, hang on to my driver's license, you know. <laughs> I, and I was being selfish as a kid, but we didn't, I couldn't fully wrap my mind around exactly what all that was. But now that we are, you know, when you think about it, if I take care of myself and do all the things I'm supposed to be doing, I, I, I stand a chance to live another 30 years here on planet Earth. I hope to, if the Jesus cherries. All right, I know, and I'm not looking to leave planet Earth anytime soon. But if God calls me home tomorrow, that's okay. All right. I was going to say that some of these people, because you mentioned it earlier about these old sages, have that look in their eye about trying to go to heaven sooner. Um, and I know from other folks that are up there in age, because a lot of their friends die, and a lot of the loved ones that they had are gone. And it's different now, so they can't even really take care of themselves like they used to. And it's like, you know what, after a certain point, I just want to go. Mm -hmm. Well, I go out to the cemetery, and we've done that several times. Um, Pastor Greg and I, we hang out a lot. And so we went out to the cemetery. I showed him, introduced him to my mom and dad. Um, and I introduced him to my sister. And then we began to walk around the cemetery, and I began to introduce him to all the people that I know out there. And it wasn't like that 25 years ago. So the older we get, the more people that, you know what I mean? Uh, and so now our heart longs more as our friends and loved ones go before us than it did before. Um, you heard me kind of reference that song, I've got more to go to heaven for than I had yesterday. All right. There's a brand new angel in the choir. I want to hear her sing. All right, and so my mom died. They give me more reason to want to go to heaven. Amen. But I tell you what, the sting of death is not there anymore. Well, what? Well, amen. Amen. I appreciate your faith that the Lord's going to keep me here, brother. We would carry on His legacy through the people that we meet. Yes. Amen. All right. Someone else with a comment? Question. I was going to say, it isn't always senior citizens that have that longing, longing to go go home. I had a friend that passed away about, I think it's now four, three or four years ago. And she had issues with, with cancer. And to give you an idea, age-wise, she, she was only a day older than I was. And... That very last year, that was where, that's where she was aiming for. Mm -hmm. There, were, so it it just it all depends. I'd say it depends on when you're a senior citizen in your life. That well, that the passage of scripture says, "O oh, grave, where is thy victory? O oh, death, where is thy sting?" All right, and so for the believer, we transition. From this existence to life eternal with our Lord. Amen? Amen. And so that's walking after the Spirit. Now here's what happens. Anybody with a comment? Uh, here's what happens when we walk after the flesh. And here's the end of those who fulfill the lust of the flesh. In Galatians chapter 5, verse number 21, it says this. 
and beings, murderers, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And so that's what happens to an individual who walks after the flesh. He doesn't say you inherit hell, but that's the, that's the parenthetical opposite of not inheriting the kingdom of God. Uh, and so we have the end of those who fulfill those lusts, they, inherit, they do not inherit the kingdom of God. Second of all, they inherit the wrath of God. Uh, in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, if you keep in track, um, if you're there nearby, you can go ahead and flip over there. But I, wanna, I want you to see this in print. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. And the Apostle Paul is, I think, sometimes even speaking to modern-day preachers of today, progressive, so-called progressive preachers. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 6, says this, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. And so the end result of those who fill the lust of the flesh is that they don't inherit the kingdom of God. They indeed inherit the wrath of God upon them. And I heard Pastor Hagee say, the only thing that measures equally with the love of God is the wrath of God. Um, and so that's what those who follow the lust of the flesh will do. So, which shall it be? Walk in the Spirit or fulfill the lusts of the flesh? Isn't there a clear choice here? Um, what does the walking in the Spirit offer us? I'll let you answer. I, I, I got you got what I want to tell you. But what does what's some, the benefit of walking in the Spirit? What's that? Peace and contentment. Joy. What's that? Joy. Joy. Heaven. Heaven. Happy eternal life. All right. I'm going to use this word. Free from condemnation. What's that word? What's the root word in condemnation? Condemned. Condemned. Do you know before we come to know Christ, we're all condemned? And Christ does what? Sets us free. Amen. And so there is that clear choice. Um, and walking after the flesh offers no heavenly kingdom. And it's miserable. Yeah, it's a messed up life. It's, it's, uh, you're tired. Physically, well not physically, but emotionally and spiritually. Because walking the flesh, you're chasing something. You don't know what you're chasing. But subconsciously, you're always chasing after something. And... You try to find that. Yeah, you try, yeah, you try, yeah. You're trying to fill that void. Mm -hmm. You don't realize you're trying to fill a void, but that's what you're out there doing. You're out doing whatever the picture points. Mm -hmm. You're trying to fill that that void, and you can't fill it, and it just it, it wears you down. Amen. You can look at you can look at a lot of people out there today. Um, be it from entertainment to politi um, political figures, to everybody walking daily lives. They have this look in their eye, and you can see that there's they're, a longing or a sadness and something missing. Even though they're sitting there smiling and laughing or whatever, there's still that emptiness is still there. They're when you're walking, when you, but when you're in the flip, when you're walking in the spirit, that emptiness isn't there anymore because that is filled, and you know what you know what you need to fill it with. But when you're just in the flesh, you have no idea what to fill it with, or you're running from it. Okay. Um, you said a word that struck a, a note with me. Who did God call the wisest man on planet Earth ever? King Solomon. And King Solomon, in a nutshell of everything you just said and what you just said, he called it chasing the wind or batting the wind. Can you catch the wind? Can you, can you bat the wind? What happens when you bat the wind? Nothing. <laughs> What's that? You'll yeah, you'll whiff and you're tired after it's all said and done. Making more. Now, yeah, and exactly. Um, what, what's, what lifestyle did King Solomon have, by the way? Oh, he had a whacked out one, tons of wires. 
porcupines, concubines, seals. Yeah, a thousand wives and porcupines, as one kid said in Sunday school class. That's a lot of pricking. He lived in the flesh. He lived in the flesh, but God called him the wisest man on planet Earth. But he was also one of the richest and, kings. And God put this innate need in each and every human being that he created. Um... And the need is supposed to be filled with Jesus Christ. Amen. Right? Somebody's been listening yeah. to the preacher preach. Yeah, and, and so the people who, the free will, that's the people who are out chasing rainbows or crack through the bottle when if, if you just go where God sent you in the first place, you could avoid a whole lot of trouble. Amen. Um, I had... Uh, Fella, he's deceased now, but he got saved late in life. He spent his entire young adulthood in the world. And Paul was uh, Ken King when he got saved. He was in his late 50s, early 60s. Uh, and he said his greatest life regret was that he didn't turn his life over to Christ sooner. Amen. And even as a Christian believer on his way to the kingdom, he still had a regret that he lived the better part of two-thirds of his life in the world, chasing the wind. Was that a real bus driver back then? Yeah. I remember him. Yeah. All right. Comment, question? We got a few minutes here. Um, doing good on time. Uh, but Paul gives us uh, two more reasons to make the right choice. Um, those who are Christ, and this is going to be a hard pill to swallow, but Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 24, and see if we can look at that passage together. Here's the Apostle Paul writing. Are you there? Yeah. All right. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be subject unto their own hope. Oh, I see, I might have, I got the wrong passage. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the, the first part of that is what I want. All right. Uh, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives uh, submit to their own husbands. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And so there is a one thing for us to understand that there is another reason for us to live after Christ that we have to crucify this flesh. Somebody help me out with crucify the flesh. When do you crucify the flesh? What did Paul say, huh? Daily. Paul has to crucify the flesh daily. Because you know why? Because at nighttime the zombies come out. That's right. And he has to kill that thing again. All right. So we have to, because as, as long as we're wrapped in this stuff, the flesh is always going to try to torment us, right? And the enemy already knows what your and my weakness is. Don't say it out loud. What's your weakness? Don't say it out loud. See, the enemy knows too. And so that's why we are to crucify or put to death this flesh. And once again, um, it wants to resurrect its ugly head uh, and let it run and let it roam and let it reign in our lives. You see, the old man is supposed to be crucified with him that we might no longer be slaves to sin. Romans chapter 1, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. So... We crucify the flesh with Christ. And so we may be tempted in the flesh, but the flesh no longer has power over us if we have crucified the flesh and we walk with Christ. He will give us the power to overcome the flesh, right? You believe that? Yes. So someone who has been an alcoholic, What happens? They crucify the flesh. I once was, now I'm not. A lot of people say, well, you're an alcoholic until the day you die. No, you're not. I don't believe it. If Jesus has, has cruci helps you crucify, and that doesn't mean people won't relapse and have problems, but I, I tell you what, when we label junk, it makes people a reason, gives them a reason to sin more. So how about this? When Jesus saves us, he saves us completely. Amen. All right? But we have to put this flesh to death and understand that the power of the spirit, capital S, is greater than the power of the flesh, capital, or uh, lowercase f, flesh. All right? 
Anybody have a comment, question? Yeah, it's just like smoking. Uh, a person, they, they get so addicted to it, they just can't get away from it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's tearing the lungs up, and it, it does a lot of damage. Well, if we cru crucify the flesh, it also helps us in baptism. We died to sin, having been crucified with, with the Christ. Our old man was crucified with him. We died with Christ when we got saved. And we might be free from sin and live a life new in him. And so second of all, as Christians, we are to continue to crucify the self. We continue to put to death the members which are on earth. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. Anybody um, ever been sanctified? Anybody? What's sanctification? We talked about this a little bit. We give a little bit of a lesson. What? The, the sanctification and justification. justification. What's sanctification? Justification is just as if it never happened. Okay. Good. We're justified in the sight of God. Correct. Sanctification is... Help me. Brother Knight. <laughs> Tim looks over Brother Knight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the daily work. Is that what it is? Alright. We're being sanctified on a daily basis. And you heard me, you heard me say this before. Uh, some of my Pentecostal brothers think they're sanctified now. That they don't, they're not capable of sinning. All you got to do is play golf with them one time. You know that they ain't sanctified. All right? So we're all being sanctified on a daily basis. If we're not doing this, Romans chapter 8, verse number 13. Flip over there. I want you to see this in print. Romans chapter 8, verse number 13. Very important passage of Scripture. Christian, if supposed Christian believers come to you and say, I can still sin and do what I want and live my life after the flesh and still go to heaven, you take them right to this passage of Scripture. And here it is, Romans chapter 8, verse number 13. For if we live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you live through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Is that pretty clear, isn't it? So we walk after the flesh, what happens? We die. We die. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is? Death. All right. And then we go on to see that the Apostle Paul says, living after the Spirit, you shall live. And so we need to continue to put the, our members to death, uh, which are on this earth. And we must be involved in the process of putting off that old man. And I spoke about that just a few moments ago, and I love that song by the... Um, um, what's my group that comes and sings? The Stony Creek Singers. And he sings, he sings that beautiful song about two coats. The old coat and the new coat. Alright? We need to put on that new coat. So, if we're not doing this, Romans 8.13 tells us there's no hope. And there's only hope in Christ. So, Putting off the works of the flesh, therefore, is fundamental to our Christian life. You can how that we that are dead to sin live any longer in it, is what the Scripture says. We started a process when we were baptized into Christ, and we are to continue the process as we grow in the Lord. So you see, we're not alone in this effort. Paul indicated in Romans 8, 13, and it is by the Spirit that we're able to put to death the deeds of the body. If you try to put to death... The deeds of the body, you're going to fail. Philippians 4.13, however, says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Um, a lot of people says, I can kick this, I can kick this, I can kick this. You ain't going to kick nothing without Jesus. Amen. All right? So we're not alone in this effort. So, uh, let's see, I got uh, one last point. If we live in the Spirit... Let us walk in the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. You, you see, we owe our spiritual lives to, Mona spoke about, the Holy Spirit of God. You see, it was the Holy Spirit who made the gospel known to mankind. 
as Jesus said he would. The apostles attributed the gospel message to the Holy Spirit, and when one responds to the gospel of God's grace, they are renewed by the Holy Spirit, Titus chapter 3. You see, it is the Spirit in us who gives us that new life. And so when we give our hearts to Christ, who comes to live with us, rule and reign in our lives? Holy Spirit. Yeah, amen. That comforter, brother. Back up to verse 14 of chapter 5. Uh, Galatians or five, uh, Galatians? Romans. Oh, Romans, verse 14 of chapter 5? Excuse me. Chapter 8? Yeah. All right. All right. Amen. That, uh, that's, uh, read that for us. For if many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Amen. So how do we know that we're son of God or daughter of God? We're led by His Spirit. Amen. Uh, thank you for that comment. Any other question or comment? So, since we live in the Spirit, shall we not walk in the Spirit? We ought to. See, it's by the Holy Spirit that God made our lives new. And it is only proper that we should live out our new life walking in the Spirit. My mom said to me something some time ago. Doug, who knew my mom in this room? All right, several people. All right. Um, Doug, you knew my mom? I didn't even know she was your mother until she told me. Yeah. Um, but when I was a child, and I told you this story, and I, I apologize once again for giving you a retread, but um, I, my mom was dropping me off at my job at McDonald's. And for whatever reason, I said something contrary to her. Right? And I, I didn't curse at her. I, I never cursed at my parents at all. Um, I see kids curse their parents out. I never cursed my parents out. I actually, I would have been, we wouldn't have this conversation if that had happened. I'd be deceased. Uh, my, I'd be planted out in a cemetery somewhere. Um, but anyway, um, I said something to my mom and she got mad at me. And she says to me, I would have expected that from your brother or your sister. But never from you. <coughs> Remove thy dagger from my heart. Um, it crushed me. How much more should we not want to disappoint our Lord? Amen? How much more should we want to walk in the Spirit, not after the flesh? Not because necessarily we got a heaven to gain. We know that's coming. We got a beautiful kingdom that God has prepared, a, a, a room in His house that He's prepared for us. But how much more should we want to live right, walk right in the presence of an Almighty God that we shouldn't want to disappoint Him? Don't worry about disappointing Pastor Buddy. You know what happens? Pastor Buddy will never, ever be disappointed in you if you don't ever, ever disappoint the Lord. Does that make sense? So when I look out on Sunday night, you all are here. But when I look out and I, I see an empty bench somewhere and I know so-and-so is not here, I'm disappointed. That disappoints me. On Sunday morning, I stand and I preach and I look out and I know where everybody sits and I know what people are missing. I'm disappointed. You imagine if I'm disappointed that they're not in God's house. Imagine how the Lord feels. Amen? And don't you think even the most smallest and simplest of things that disappoint God are not really small and simple and insignificant? They're very important. All right. Any other question, comment? We'll wrap up this lesson. Uh, let me see if I got one more comment. Uh, one more. Um, yeah. The question we face is this. The flesh or the spirit, which shall we serve. All right? Comment, question? Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for your unrelenting love towards us. And Lord, as we strive as human beings to walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, I pray in this walk with you that this daily sanctification will continue to happen. Father, give us wisdom and guidance and direction in everything that we do that we might ever not ever disappoint you now bless us as we go home to our separate places give us traveling safety and traveling mercy 
Dismiss us from this place once again, but never, ever, ever from my presence. In Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming tonight. Thanks for being here early as well. God bless you all. Let's close it.